The views and opinions expressed on Unlock Your Wealth Radio are those of the host, guests, and callers only and are not necessarily the views of Unlock Your Wealth Radio, Heather Wagonalls, or Success Publishing International. Worried about retirement? Want to travel the world or just be around to watch your kids grow up but you can't because you're drowning in debt? Now you can! With Heather Wagonhalls and the Keys to Riches powered by Unlock Your Wealth Radio. Heather will show you how to stop chasing your wallet, eliminate debt, lose financial stress, and live the life of your dreams. If you truly ever wanted to have more, do more, be a give back more, now's your chance. Listen weekly to hear what others are doing to manage their money better with these proven strategies for building wealth with the Keys to Riches financial philosophy. Now, here's your host, Heather Wagonhalls. That's me, Heather Wagonhalls, and today's episode is sponsored in part by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at keystoriches.com forward slash free book and click on the link to over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Woo! Nice. See, I got it all except when I have to change the websites. Yeah thing. So Heather Wagonhall's here ready to purvey some prosperity upon you today. I will do that with my co-host. That would be the maestro of moolah, Michael Terry. Hey folks. And we will help you get your money mind right on today's episode with the following great features. So um, Michael has brought to the table a fabulous um, moolah word, which we will discuss, but we also have a great key today. What's our key? Uh, uh, create credit. There you go. Number nine. <laughs> who was who was the group? Uh, Trivia question. Oh, is it the Sh- Shirelles? Uh, the Shirelles might have cut it, but I don't think they had the big hit. The big hit was from a a British invasion group called the, um, I believe it was the Seekers. The Seekers. And this could require some looking up. Uh-oh. You, you go on with your show. You'll do some recon while uh, and verification, fact checking. Yeah. Fact check before you ask a trivia question you don't know the answer to. But anyway, <clears throat> moving right along. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we have an incredible show. So we're on create credit. So this is a fantastic key. Plus, uh, we have a great moneyism. And I heard this the other day, and I thought, oh my gosh, when I heard this person say this to another person, I was walking through the mall. And uh, I was uh, I wasn't directly eavesdropping because I was in a forward motion, but I overheard this person say to another person, "This particular moneyism, and we're going to dispel this moneyism through this week's key, which is create credit." But the moneyism is uh, um, you're only as good as your last credit score. And it's a misnomer, and we're going to talk about why it's a negative moneyism and what we really should be thinking about when it comes to our credit and what we really should be focusing on. Because it doesn't matter what your score is, underwriters are only using that as part of your full underwriting picture. The searchers. The searchers. the seekers. I mean, I was close, but... Did the Shirelles cut it? Doesn't look like it. No? It was written by Lieber and Stoller, who wrote... So many Elvis hit. Yeah, they were around for quite a this while. Is, by the way, this is becoming a, we're having a little sidebar of within the show. Of this is the musical the, keys the music, to riches. Music <laughs> trivia. <laughs> I knew so, I would get in here sooner or later. There you go. <laughs> you just, uh, pretty soon you're going to be taking over and it'll be the, <laughs> the musical keys to riches. And there are 12 of them. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's why Heather Wagonhall's The Keys to Riches Financial Philosophy is better because it's a baker's dozen. We got 13. 13, yeah. We got 13, big guy. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, thanks for stopping by. We're so glad to have you. Um, But let's talk about, uh, before we get to our key, let's talk about our moolah word courtesy of the maestro of moolah. And uh, so today's moolah word is trickle-down theory. So you may have heard it as trickle-down economics, but it is actually a theory. Trickle-down theory is an economic theory with which advocates letting businesses flourish since their profits will ultimately trickle down to lower-income individuals and the rest of the economy. And so your friend, or well, you were having this discussion with a friend, which, which prompted this Moolah word of the day, yeah. and you are taking issue with what? I'm taking issue with the word trickle because it's a... 
it has a negative connotation, but you know, it, it you know, er, all economics in a sense is trickle down, but it could easily be flow down or flow across or right. you know, it doesn't have well, to be Well, the economy flows. It yeah. ebbs and flows. Right. And so we, that's what we talk about. Um when we talk about it in general. So, um while the word trickle isn't necessarily um uh, negative in and of itself, it's implying that somehow the faucet is getting turned off yeah. or something. Um, but I think that what people don't realize or, or is that at some point, I mean, the flow of money decreases the further down it goes. But here's the thing that, that we're not considering. When we think about trickle down. The first people that get paid when a company makes money are the vendors, the people that provide the tools or the resources that build whatever the product or service is. Right. So those people are going to get a bulk of the money because the profits isn't the bulk of what happens in a company that manufactures it. Because in some things like, you know, some of these information things, like I know that in information products, marketing, um, you make just a boatload, a killing. And you're not producing over and over. You produce one time and then you sell over and over. So there's a different deal there. But So let's talk in terms of production where we have to buy raw materials and then make something and then sell it. So we've got the bulk of the payment or the money that a company receives for a product or a good going to the suppliers. And in that connotation or that context of suppliers, I'm talking about people that work, employees, because they are providing a service. They're the ones that are building the product. So they are supplying something in the value add from raw material to finish good. Okay. So we immediately take a big chunk out in the economy as far as flow is concerned because it flows to that first person right mm -hmm, there. Right. All those people on that supply side level supplying raw materials or, or services. So trickle down from that perspective works really good. But the benefit of allowing businesses to build, especially to grow and expand, is we get what we call economies of scale. And when I say that they get, when they can grow and be big and increase market share and, and don't have ridiculous legislation that costs them more money to raise the price of a good, it actually decreases the price of a good. And so that's, you know, the quote trickle down effect, because not only are you getting a direct representation of the company's profit because you get paid for, for or remunerated for your services or whatever goods you supply. But you also get another ancillary benefit when you go to buy goods and services because costs go down. And that's the one thing that, that people miss is that it's not about this, you know, XYZ corporation making tons of money and you, the little guy, not getting anything. If you didn't work for that company and get a direct benefit from that company, you get an ancillary benefit because you get the lower price. Because in, in a market where there's healthy competition, it's not in a company's best interest to hold back more profits if they reduce their costs. Because the next guy that's just as big as they are can produce the same widget and they can undercut you. So it's not in their best interest to gouge the market. And and people always think about, they, they hear the term price gouging and stuff like that, and it's unfair business practices when people artificially inflate goods and services. I think about the gas crunch that we had here in Arizona in the 90s, and you had a gas station on all four corners, and all four corners agreed to keep the price above the market. Yeah. You know, so they were holding steady, even though prices were falling, they were, tr they were trying to fix the market. It was bad for the consumer because they were gouging the market. They were oh, overinflating prices. And they all agreed, all, all, all. Collusion. Yes. They all agreed to do that. And, and so, um, that's not healthy when people, right. w and, and regulation does the same thing as collusion. When a government mandates that, that your, your competition out of business and you set your own price, you're gouging. You could be gouging. Yeah. You know, and that's what happens when we have, you know, uh, price floors and price ceilings, you know, um, and you, it, it destroys economies. Just look what happens in these communist countries where the government controls industry. Yeah. And they say, you must produce this at a certain price, but the market will bear maybe a different price or it can't be produced for that. 
So then what happens? People go out of business. And then everybody yells and screams. So we have to give business the freedom to be in business and do business. Yeah. And I think that that's the thing that, that most people forget, uh, whether they put labels on them. And I looked up the etymology of the word, and there was no etymology of silly liberal person coming up with yeah. this phrase. I wonder who did. But uh, yeah, so I couldn't find that. Yeah. But but trickle down theory works. I mean, it, I personally experienced that as a kid, and it's what me made me, me, you know, too. get involved in in politics to the degree that I am. Because, you know, under a Democratic administration of Jimmy Carter, my mom went to the store and spent twenty bag twenty dollars for a groceries and came home with two bags. And when my uh, mom went to the grocery when a Republican Reagan was in office, she went and spent the same twenty dollars, but she was coming home with five bags of groceries. So you can't tell me that it doesn't trickle down, that it doesn't work. Yeah. There is flow. When businesses can perform at their highest and best utility, everybody benefits. And you can't argue that fact. Yep. Now I'm t- I'm sick of both parties, and I'm hoping that there's going to be a sensible third party. Yeah. I'm hoping yeah. we get into the debates. Yeah. But that's another conversation for another show. We need to just come up with another show. Yeah. <laughs> Our little political show. <laughs> so uh, so let's get to our key. So for those of you joining us for the first time, the keys to riches is a financial philosophy that teaches you how to think like the rich and be in control of your own money. It also gives you specific techniques to create or fix your credit, eliminate debt, save and invest, building wealth while transforming your current financial habits into healthy money management skills. And we do this one week at a time, one key at a time here at Keys to Riches Radio powered by Unlock Your Wealth Radio. And uh, the value is that you get each week, you get a new key to focus on, apply and integrate because this is a biology based money management show. And it's essentially about figuring out what's going wrong inside. And we've done most of that heavy lifting so far because we're at key nine this week with our create credit in the season. We've got a couple more keys that are going to start addressing biology as we move uh, forward through the rest of the keys. We've got forget the perfection principle and practicing the three R's, which will close the loop on our goal achievement strategy that we started in our dreams with deadlines key back in key three. And if all of this sounds like Chinese to you, it's because you haven't heard the rest of the season. So I encourage you to visit our website at keys to riches.com and download past episodes so you can be up to snuff, so to speak, here at the keys and you'll be on target with where we're going today. So this part of of Keys to Riches powered by Unlock Your Wealth Radio is sponsored by keepmyid.org, the only service that actually prevents identity theft. All others are just monitoring services. Put your credit on lockdown with their special offer for Keys to Riches radio listeners at keystoriches.com forward slash keepmyid and click on the link to start protecting your family and your financial future right now. Remember to use promo code WAGS. So this week's key is a really awesome key because we've gotten over the hurdle of all of the biological and emotional obstacles that we may be facing and we've created strategies to overcome those. So now we can start getting serious about managing our money effectively. And now that we've started the routine, so we're now at week nine, so we're kind of in the groove of doing what we're supposed to be doing each and every day, each and every week when when it comes to our money. So now we can start focusing on some of the big picture items that are going to really create financial freedom for us. And this key goes hand in hand with next week's key, which is remember real estate. And this week's key, we're going to talk about underwriting for a moment, and we're going to finish up the conversation in next week's key with Remember Real Estate, because we're going to talk about ratios there. But essentially, when an underwriter makes a loan determination, whether it's for a credit card, a car, an RV, recreational vehicle, or a home, they evaluate each loan based on these four criteria. And these four underwriting criteria uh, have been referred to in a couple of different ways. They, they are the four C's or the four layers of risk. And the reason why they're referred to as layers of risk is simply that you don't have to be 100% in each category to get a great loan. You just have to be able to compensate for the deficiencies in certain categories with others. And so I'll say this up front. Cash is cool, but credit is king. And in order to really build wealth and exponentially increase your net worth, you have to be able to leverage yourself successfully. And the only way we can do that is to apply for credit because credit is leverage. 
because you're using somebody else's money to get where you want to go. So understanding and being able to think like an underwriter as you approach every new expenditure and every opportunity to finance something, thinking like an underwriter is really going to make a difference for you in how quickly you're able to build wealth because you don't have to have perfect credit to start building wealth. And building wealth starts by creating the ideal credit profile. Notice I used the word ideal and I didn't use the word perfect because perfection does not exist as statistically unattainable Mm -hmm. when it comes to these scoring models. So there's four layers of risk and I'm going to enumerate them. We'll talk about more about them in next week's show because we're going to focus on the most important one in today's show, which is the credit layer of risk. So the four C's are this character, capacity, capital, and collateral. I'll get rid of the first one. Collateral is whatever it is that you're buying that you put up in uh, in order to collateralize the loan or provide some sort of asset to offset the amount that you're borrowing. So in the case of a mortgage, you put up the home itself. That's your collateral. And so in an underwriting scenario, it needs to be valued at at minimum, whatever you borrow or more, a percentage of that. And so when we deal with uh, single family homes and owner occupied stuff, we're talking that we can have lower down payments. But when we talk about riskier investments like non-owner occupied, meaning investment property, we're talking a totally different ballgame because if you have a home that you live in, owner occupied, and you have an investment property, non-owner occupied, and push comes to shove and you can't make a mortgage payment, which one are you going to make? The one on the home you live in. Correct. So that makes the loan on the investment property for the bank more risky. Not inescapable, but just more risky. So you have usually a higher interest rate or you can offset the interest rate by using some strategies. And that's a culmination of good credit and cash. And so we're going to talk about that. So the next layer of risk I want to get rid of is capital. And capital is two things. It's how much you put down and how much you have left over. If you blow your whole wad on the down payment, you're not going to have any reserves for house payments. And so there's always a blend that's required depending on the type of financing you're getting. And so that's what capital is. Um, But capital can be any kind of liquid or liquidatable investment. Um, You can use for verification of assets and reserves, you can use retirement accounts because even though they're not liquid, they can uh, be counted as cash reserves because you can convert them. If it is retirement, they're going to adjust the number. So let's say you have a hundred grand in your uh, retirement account and the penalty for pulling that out early is 30%. They're going to give you 70 cents on every dollar right, right, a- right. A- as your credit. Makes but sense. it doesn't take much to offset reserves. Um, so that's why retirement accounts are a great option. Plus, you don't want to disclose all your assets, just enough to satisfy the lender that, you, that you're flush with cash. Uh, so the next layer of risk, which we're going to talk about in detail next week, and that's capacity because that has to do with your ability to repay the note. So this has to do with income. Income from all sources and the size of the payment. And so your ratios are built off of that. Your your total debt ratio, which includes your house payment, plus your housing ratio, which includes all home-related expenses with regard to the loan, which is principal interest, taxes, insurance, and homeowners association if you live in a community that has one. And that's all for next week's show. So we'll discuss that in detail because we're going to start identifying how close to or far away we are from beginning our first real estate acquisition next week. Our sole concern is this character layer of risk today. And that is our character has to do with our ability to manage debt. How well have we repaid our previous obligations? And, you know, behavior, as we talk about all the time on this show, is subconscious, okay? Discipline and willpower is a conscious activity, but behavior is subconscious, meaning you don't think about it, you just do it. If you remember in our three amigos theory of information processing, it's I do, I feel, I think. And so this is concerned with the I do part. How well do you treat current and past obligations? Because like mutual funds, past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results, but it's a good indicator. And since behavior is usually static, unless we have some sort of catastrophic event that moves us away from our current behaviors towards something better, 
likely will just default to autopilot. And that's just what we do. It's not a bad thing. It's just an observation. Mm. Um, so how you've paid your bills in the past is likely how you'll pay your bills in the future. And a lender needs to understand how you're going to pay this obligation because a mortgage is the single largest financial obligation any person or, or family can make. I mean, it, it, it will make or break what, what happens to your family's financial future. It can be devastating or it can be something fabulous. It's all in how it's approached. Yeah. So we need to discuss what goes into a credit profile and what the ideal credit profile is. So there are 85 factors that go into a credit score. Uh, and scores are not credit profiles. Scores are simply a statistical measure of default. And the higher the score, the less likely you'll default. These things have evolved over time. I remember when the first mortgage score came out and the lower the score, it was the better you are off. Now it's the higher the score, the better you're off. But it's not an actual representation of what an underwriter looks for when it comes to a mortgage. That's why credit quality will trump credit score because credit scores are subjective, meaning at any given time, something's going on in your credit profile. And that can adversely affect your score, even though nothing negative has happened. If if you've always paid your bills, that's no big deal, right? But let's just say a particular balance hits, but and and then the reporting cycle occurs before your payment hits, and so it looks like you're maxed out. Right. That's going to drag down your score, and it happens to the best of us. You know, I pay my credit cards off every month, and so when I pay my card off, um, you know, I, I'm usually close to the max. You know, I because I put all my business expenses on on one of my rewards cards so I can maximize my rewards card. Sure. I paid all my bills, I pay everything with this one card because the rewards are so awesome that I mean, otherwise I wouldn't, you know, I I, I wouldn't be um I wouldn't be making all of these rewards. I wouldn't be able to fly around for free. Yeah. Because I just I I, I do it on points. And so um but at any given time, any one of my cards can be maxed out or close to max, mm -hmm. you know, cause I, I, I just, uh, um, I just, I have what I need, you know what I mean? And, and that's it. So, uh, so at any given time, my score can fluctuate, um, and severely, you know, but la usually it's in the seven hundreds, but depending on when it cycles, sometimes I've had them pull in the six hundreds. That doesn't mean I'm a bad person, you know, and right. that plays into t this week's moneyism, which, you know, is you're only as good as your last credit score. That's malarkey because your credit score is not static. So the way a credit score is calculated, just so you understand, it takes a look at everything in your profile. And then it compares everything in your profile based on these 85 factors and it compares them to other people with similar or identical credit profiles. And then it comes up with a statistical average. So if anybody tells you a, spe a specific event in your credit has a point value, you need to run away from them, not walk run because they have no idea what they're talking about. It's a statistical formula. So there's no way to know exactly how an inquiry will affect you um, and what inquiries affect you. An underwriter says yes or no, not a score. So um, there are 85 factors that go into a credit score. There's two things that are not taken into consideration. One is Equal Credit Opportunity Act factors, which is race, country, color, creed, religion, uh, you know, gender, age, all of that stuff. That's not included. And your income is not included in your credit score. All right. So it's just based on 85 factors, but here are the top three. So we know what they are. So they are uh, your um, open and available credit. So, and, and it's a ratio. And so if you have a thousand dollar credit line that's open, but only $200 of that is available, meaning you've got an $800 balance, um, that has a 30 percent, 35 percent impact on your score. So if you had a thousand dollar open credit line and a thousand dollars available, you'd get all 35 percent of that value. Mm. OK, so it, it, it's it squishes the score exponentially. So that's why it's important to pay your bills off every month. Um, in right. addition to not paying interest, you also don't um, affect your score if you're score driven. But at the end of the month, if that if you get your credit checked the day before you pay that off, 
Is that is your Well, here's the deal. You can actually pay it off, but it's a voluntary system. So when I say voluntary, it means that the uh, lender can report on whatever schedule they choose. Okay. So some lenders report monthly, some report weekly, some gotcha. report quarterly. Okay. And collection companies are notorious for reporting when the collection goes on, but they fail to get back yeah. and remove it. And we don't want to change that, okay? Because remember, when we start messing with things, that's when costs go up. Right. So we want to leave it alone. It's a voluntary system. And uh, so you don't know how it's going to affect your score. The only way to do that is to get a full uh, verified uh, residential uh, tri-merged credit report. And then they actually physically call up every lender and confirm it over the phone. Um, and then generate a score based on the information in the profile that way. Um, and, and you only need to do that if stuff is severely wrong um, or, it, you know, unless uh, you're doing a government uh insured mortgage because then they'll require that every trade line be updated to the most recent 30 day cycle. Uh, but other than that, um, uh, so open and available credit is, is the heaviest weighted part of your score. 30% of your score has to do with on time payments, but here's the catch and that people don't realize it only goes back 24 months that affects your score. So it only looks at the most recent 24 months. So if you missed a payment at like four years ago, doesn't matter. Yes, it'll be indicated on there, uh, on, on the uh, on the legend, so an underwriter can see that. But as far as your score is concerned, if the last 24 are thumbs up, you're thumbs up. You get the full credit of that 30%. Uh, and, and an underwriter can tell something your score can't. An underwriter can tell if you have a catastrophic event, like let's say you were in a car accident and you were laid up for six weeks. And so your bills, all of your bills that report on your credit uh, go 60 days late, but then you catch them all up. So that was a single event. That was a single catastrophic event. You can write um, a, um, a letter of explanation and get around that every time if you know what you're doing. Mm. Um, and I have those, by the way, on the website at keystoriches.com if you want to look that up as a resource. Uh, so the And then 15% of your score is actually how... Uh, long you have had your cards open. So don't listen to these people that tell you to cut up your cards, throw them away, close out all your credit lines, because you will immediately lose 15% of the value of the history. So even if you don't use them, keep them open, just you know, keep them in a secure place. I have credit lines that I haven't used the cards for years, but I constantly you know, update them, pay the little fees and stuff. And I shredded the cards. I don't even have a card. They come in and I shred them in my shredder so I don't have to worry about them being stolen either. Uh, so ideally, we want our total monthly obligation in payments, because this will count in that ratio I was telling you about, to be less than 8% for conforming conventional and less than 10 for government financed loans. If your um, monthly obligations are more than 10% of your monthly gross income, You've got some problems. We're going to talk about how to fix that on next week's show with Remember Real Estate because that's how we're going to determine what our affordability is. But it's important that you understand what goes into your credit, what goes into an effective credit score, and what you can do to create the ideal credit profile. So time heals all wounds, and you don't need a whole lot of time. You know, like I said, 24 months. If you're distanced 24 months from the last negative event, you probably have a much better credit score than you think you do. But you need to get and check your credit at um, annualcreditreport.com, which is the only place that has truly free credit that's sponsored by the credit bureaus, a, t a truly free credit report. And um, uh, if you'd like, I also do complimentary uh, credit analysis. Um, I'm a certified credit report reviewer, so you can always stop by the website and request a free credit analysis, and I'll tell you what you need to do to get your credit on track. That's it for this week's key. For your key statement, key affirmation, and key action item, plus all kinds of other stuff, please visit our website at keystoriches.com. And for the maestro of moolah, Michael Terry, I'm Heather Wagonhalls for the Keys to Riches, powered by Unlock Your Wealth Radio. Now go out and unlock your wealth today. UnlockYourWealthRadio.com is produced by Heather Wagonhalls and the Unlock Your Wealth Foundation. 
UnlockYourWealthRadio.com and its affiliates are copyrighted 2016 with all rights reserved. For more information on the Keys to Riches Financial Wellness Series, please visit our website at www.unlockyourwealth.com.